If you flip to the back of Griffith's electrodynamics textbook, you'll find these relations from vector calculus. In particular, we have the 3D line element and the volume elements for three different coordinate systems. These come up all the time in essentially all upper-level physics classes. In this video, I'll show how to derive the infinitesimal line element vector. I'll use a mnemonic way that relies on geometry rather than doing any rigorous math. In the process, we'll see that we'll be able to get the volume element for free without having to do any extra work. Let's start with Cartesian coordinates. I've drawn a 3D grid where the axes are x hat, y hat, and z hat. In green, we have an arbitrary point, and we know that in Cartesian coordinates, we can represent this point with the three coordinates x, y, and z. To get the 3D line element, the main idea is that we want to figure out what physical lengths would a change in all three of these correspond to. So to explain that, let's start by looking at x. If we were to shift x by some infinitesimal amount, dx, while holding both y and z constant, it would look something like this. So we've only shifted along the x-axis some amount dx. Let's do the same for both y and z. So the nice thing about Cartesian coordinates is that x, y, and z represent physical lengths along each of these three axes which we travel along to get to our point. In fact, the infinitesimal displacement vector dl for Cartesian coordinates will be dx along the x direction, plus dy in the y hat direction, plus dz in the z hat direction. Let's get the volume element next. The volume element represents the infinitesimal amount of volume we get when we increase all three of our coordinates by infinitesimal amounts dx, dy, and dz. What I mean by that is that looking at our point when it has gotten shifted by dx, dy, and dz, we've drawn this cube here. And we know that the length, width, and height of this cube is dx, dy, and dz. So therefore we can say that the volume element is dx times dy times dz. One quick note is that some authors may call dv d tau or even d cubed r, but they all represent the same thing. Now let's look at spherical coordinates. Our point can be represented with the three variables r, theta, and phi. r is the distance from the origin to our point and the r hat unit vector points in the same direction. Theta is the angle from the z-axis to the r vector, and theta hat will be the direction in which our theta coordinate will increase. Finally, for phi, let's make a projection of our r vector down to the xy plane. Phi is the angle from the x-axis to our projection, and phi hat will be the direction which increases phi. So to get started calculating dl, let's first consider what happens when we increase our r-coordinate by some infinitesimal amount dr while holding theta and phi constant. So we'll travel along our r hat unit vector some amount dr and we'll end up over here. Similar to Cartesian coordinates, we can start by writing dr in the r hat direction for our increase in length. Next, let's consider what happens when we change our theta variable by some amount d theta. If we hold r constant and increase theta, the path which our point will be shifted along will be an arc length of a circle and it will be this arc here, shown in green. The radius will still be r, and the angle of this arc will be d theta. So now it might be tempting to write d theta times theta hat for the contribution to dl. 
However, there's a problem with doing this, and the problem is that DL must have units of length. However, D theta has units of angles. So to fix this problem, let's consider what physical length change this d theta corresponds to. Meaning we need to get this arc length here. From geometry, you may recall that the arc length is given by the radius of the arc, r, times the angle of the arc, which is d theta in our case. So therefore we can write plus r d theta theta hat. Finally, let's get the contribution to dl when we increase phi by some amount d phi while holding r and theta constant. Just like for the angle theta, when we increase phi in the phi hat direction, we'll be traveling along an arc of a circle. We can draw this arc on the xy plane. The angle of the arc is d phi. To get the radius of the arc, note that we actually have a right triangle here. The hypotenuse of this triangle is r. This angle over here will be 90 degrees minus theta, because this angle is theta, and therefore this angle here will be theta. So using trig we can say that this leg of our right triangle is r times sine theta. We can once again use the formula for arc length. We know that the radius of this arc is r sine theta, and our angle is d phi. So this distance here is r sine theta times d phi. So finally, we can write down the contribution to dl, which will be r sine theta d phi times phi hat. Let's finish up spherical coordinates by finding the volume element. Just like we did for Cartesian coordinates, we need to find the infinitesimal volume change when we increase all three of our coordinates by dr, d theta, and d phi. We've already found the length changes when we've increased each of those coordinates individually, so to get dv, all we need to do is multiply these three lengths together to get something with units of volume. Therefore, dv will be dr times r d theta times r sine theta d phi. Or we can rearrange this as r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. To see dv geometrically, let's shift our d phi arc up to our point. What we'll end up with is a 3D solid, and the volume of the solid will be dv. The last coordinate system we'll look at is cylindrical coordinates. Here we can represent our point with the coordinates s, phi, and z. To start out, I've drawn an r vector again, which points from the origin to our point. I've also drawn a projection of the r vector on the xy plane. In cylindrical coordinates, this projection vector is known as s, where this is the s hat direction. Once again, the angle from the x axis to our projection is called phi, where this direction is once again phi hat. Finally, the height of our point is called z, which is identical to the Cartesian coordinate. For our line element, let's start by looking at what happens when we increase s by ds while holding phi and z constant. If we go to our projection of the point, the point will be shifted in the s hat direction by some amount ds. So similar to Cartesian coordinates and the r coordinate from spherical coordinates, we can write ds times s hat. Let's do a quick unit check. We need units of length for dl, and s and z in the cylindrical coordinate system represents a physical length. Phi is the only coordinate we need to worry about as it's an angle. Next, let's look at what happens when we increase phi by d phi while holding s and z constant. Just like for spherical coordinates, when we 
travel in the phi head direction, we're once again going to be tracing out an arc of a circle. The angle of this arc will be d phi. The radius of the arc now will just be our s coordinate, therefore, this length here, using the formula for arc length, is s times the angle of the arc, which is d phi. We can go ahead and write plus s d phi in the phi hat direction. Finally, let's increase z by dz while holding the other two coordinates constant. Our point will be shifted in the z direction by some amount dz. Just like for Cartesian coordinates, the contribution to dl will be dz times z hat. There you have it, we have our line element for cylindrical coordinates. Let's quickly write down our volume element. We know the physical length changes we get when we increase s, phi, and z. So to get the three-dimensional volume element, we can simply multiply these three changes. Our dv will be ds times s d phi times dz, which we can rewrite as s ds times d phi times dz. Using geometric arguments, we were able to derive the line element and volume elements that are given in the back of Griffiths for our three different coordinate systems. I hope this video has given you some insights into how you may be able to derive these formulas if you don't have a formula sheet handy.